Good afternoon. My name is Vicki Lesniak, and I'm a manager at the BASB XVRL taxonomy team. I'd like to welcome you to today's presentation on 2024 GAP and SEC reporting taxonomy improvements and SEC update. Before we begin, I'd like to go over some housekeeping items. There is a link to the slides in the chat. The slides can also be downloaded by going to the link provided on the XBRL news and events page of the FASB website. We encourage you to ask questions throughout the presentation. To ask a question, please type your question in the Q&A panel on your screen and click send. Remember, it's important to turn off the pop-up blockers so that your webinar functions properly. CPE credit is available for viewing the live program. Today's program will be eligible for up to 1.8 CPE credits. CPE credit is not available for group viewing. Each participant must be registered separately and meet both the polling requirements and duration requirements per NASBA. To receive CPE credit, you must stay on for the required number of minutes respond to the required number of polling questions, and complete the course evaluation at the end of the program. A recording of this webinar will be available online until April 2nd, 2025. CPE credit it will not be available to those who watch the archived program. If you have any questions about this webinar or any other educational webinar, please contact the FASB at cpedirector at fasb.org. You should receive your CPE certificates if you've met all of the requirements within two weeks of this presentation. Today's panelists include Christine Bottleson, Bottleson FASB board member, Christine Chang, Assistant Professor, Patterson School of Accountancy at the University of Mississippi, members of the SEC Structured Office of Structured Disclosure, Julie Marlowe, Assistant Director, Audrey Wang, Staff Accountant, and Brian Gale, Financial Economist, as well as Louis Mathern, Chief of Taxonomy Development at the FASB, and the FASB taxonomy team members who are presenting listed on this slide. Today's agenda includes a fireside chat with Christine Bodison and Christine Chang that will be moderated by Brian Gale. In addition, we will have an update from the SEC as well as an update from the FASB team members on the 2024 GAP taxonomy improvements. Our presentation will include an overview, segment reporting, income taxes, location dimensions, employee benefit plans, meta model, calculations 1.1, and the DQC rules taxonomy. And with that, I'm gonna turn things over to Brian Gale, who will introduce our speakers and moderate our presentation of the fireside chat today. Brian? Thank you very much, Vicki. I have the pleasure of facilitating the fireside chat today with our keynote speakers, Dr. Christine Bodison and Dr. Christine Chang. Uh, I first need to read a disclaimer. These remarks are provided in the author's official capacity as the Commission's Intergovernmental Personnel Act detail and the Office of Structured Disclosure but do not necessarily reflect the views of the commission, the commissioners, or other members of the staff. Dr. Christine Bodison is a board member with the FASB. Initially appointed in 2016, Dr. Bodison is now in her second term with the board, which extends to 2026. Prior to joining the FASB, Dr. Bodison was a professor of accounting at the David Eccles School of Business at the University of Utah. She has a broad knowledge of accounting issues with particular expertise in the areas of financial statement analysis and valuation. Dr. Bodison's research has been published in accounting, finance, and law journals. 
During Dr. Bodison's tenure at the University of Utah, she served in a variety of leadership positions, including as a leadership fellow in the office of the vice president, as the George S. and Dolores Dorr Eccles presidential chair in ethical financial reporting, and as the associate dean of graduate affairs. Dr. Bodison also served as the president of the American Accounting Association during 2014 and 2015. Dr. Christine Chang is an assistant professor at the University of Mississippi's Patterson School of Accountancy. She served as a visiting scholar with the SEC's Division of Economic and Risk Analysis and its Office of Structured Disclosure from 2020 through 2022. Dr. Chang is a member of the FASB's Taxonomy Advisory Group and is also the chair of the XBRL US's Academic Subcommittee which focuses on democratizing access to XBRL data for both research and teaching. Dr. Chang focuses her research and teaching on combining accounting and data analytics. Her research appears in both practitioner and academic journals. Dr. Chang has won several international and school-based teaching awards. She's also the 2023 graduate teacher winner of the American Accounting Association's J. Michael and Mary Ann Cook Deloitte Foundation Prize which is awarded for superior graduate accounting teaching. With both academic and standard setting backgrounds, each of you brings an extremely valuable per perspective for understanding how XBRL data is used by different stakeholders. Dr. Chang, let me start with you. Can you describe how you use XBRL data both in teaching and in academic research? Thanks, Brian. I've seen a tremendous growth and in interest in utilizing XBRL data in the last few years for both teaching and research. A major driver in the growing interest is that the work preparers do provides academics with a rich data set that allows researchers to explore how XBRL reporting decisions have unique effects on access and data processing for financial statement users. By rich, I mean that XBRL data allows us timely access to granular data that is exactly as the company intended to report. A recent paper by Kai Du, Steve Hutter, and Daniel Jang provided evidence that the XBRL, as reported XBRL data, provides additional information than the data gathered through data aggregators who standardize the data. We also use the relevant and readily accessible XBRL data for teaching. For example, in my undergraduate class, students used XBRL tags to access information relevant for decision-making surrounding bank risk during periods of increasing interest rates, the extent to which research and development expenses affect future values of tech companies, and for conducting robust financial statement analysis. Each of these projects is helping my students and other students who utilize them to think holistically and critically about the uses of XBRL data throughout their education. I expect that the increasing amount of XBRL data available and the increasing use of XBRL tagging for other reporting, like international government and ESG reporting, will continue to open the doors to a significant amount of research and teaching cases that leverage the work that the providers on the call are diligently engaged in. Thanks, Dr. Chang. Dr. Bodison, as a board member of FASB, can you walk us through how XBRL data is used throughout the standard setting process? Absolutely. Um, it's such a pleasure to be with you all this afternoon to, to share how we use the data that you produce um, in my job as a standard setter. Um, but before I begin, I also have to provide my standard disclaimer that the views that I'll express are my own because official positions of the FASB are reached only after extensive due process and deliberation. Okay, so um, our staff routinely collect XVRL data related to issues that are before the board. I find it um, particularly helpful at the beginning of a project um, to inform the board about the pervasiveness of an issue, the extent of existing diversity in practice, and the quality and the transparency of information that entities currently provide. Um, just one example, uh, recent example in our ongoing project to clarify interim disclosure requirements, the staff utilized XBRL data to get a sense of the frequency of certain disclosures um, on an interim versus an annual basis. And as a board member, I find it invaluable to get a sense of the current state of the world uh, before we embark on making changes to that state of the world via standard setting. 
Um, we also use expert data at the end of our process, though, as part of our post-implementation review. For example, as part of our post-implementation review on revenue, um, our staff utilized expert data related to transition adjustments, incremental disclosures, short cycle manufacturing, and principal versus agent decisions to get a better understanding of the financial reporting outcomes under Topic 606. And in a similar vein, we also used expert data uh, following the adoption of CECL um, in order to get a better understanding of financial reporting outcomes under CECL. So that's just a few specific examples of how we've used expert data in standard setting. Okay, so given the widespread usage, both in the academic community and among standard setters, can each of you share some of the challenges you all have run into when working with the XBRL data? Uh, Dr. Chang, let me start with you. Yeah, thanks, Brian. Um, academics seeking to use XBRL data for teaching or research need to spend a bit of time tackling a learning curve that comes with having access to such a rich information source. I'm fortunate to work with a great group of individuals who have diverse interests and are highly motivated towards democratizing access to this important data source. A primary goal of ours is to reduce barriers for using XBRL data. Towards this end, we recently created an academic subcommittee and are nearing the first iteration of a web-based repository that can be used by anybody interested in understanding the resources available to improve access to XBRL data, the structure of XBRL data, and identifying the cutting edge research that's already being done utilizing XBRL data. Another colleague, Hamid Vakrozadeh, has developed a method which provides XBRL US members an easy access to XBRL data. Since academics are increasing their use of XBRL data, I think one thing I'd like the preparers to understand is how their work may be potentially interpreted by researchers. To draw robust statistical inferences, which can inform research and potentially regulate our work, researchers need to have sufficient comparability where we can analyze trends and tag data across firms and across time. However, researchers also need meaningful variation in XBRL tagging, such as the inclusion of extensions when appropriate and necessary. As mentioned earlier, Kaidu, Steve Hutter, and Daniel Jang prove value in meaningful variation in tagging decisions. With this in mind, I think it's important for preparers to continue to use custom tags as necessary, but they should also be aware that custom tags reduce comparability and that researchers are going to interpret their use of custom tags as intentional. From my perspective, researchers' interpretation of custom tags as intentional decisions aligns with FASB's encouragement to limit the use of custom tags. One other point, if I might, um, I'm a tax person, so I spend a ton of time living in the tax footnotes space. Uh, and I'm sure that's not an area that most people think about, but I kind of want to give you guys a flavor of some things that we have specific to challenges there and how, as a preparer, you can really help us out. In my graduate class, students learn how to pull necessary data to answer the important question of how large profitable companies may report zero domestic federal tax expense. The tax rate reconciliation table provides much of that needed information, but it's an area with numerous custom tags and dimensions. The XBRL calculation relationships are extremely important in helping overcome the challenges of getting information where there is a mix of standard and custom tags. So while I'm putting this in the tax footnote space, this would be any area of the financial statement where you would have this type of mix. So at the forefront, I just want to thank the preparers on the call today for ensuring that those calculation relationships are correct, because I rely on them heavily. Dr. Bodison, any other challenges that you or others at the FASB have confronted? Well, I would say that our challenges are quite similar to those that uh, were just identified by the other Christine. Um, uh, in addition, I would say that the volume of data can be challenging to manage with the tools that we have at our disposal. Um, the learning curve is probably less of an issue for us, however, because it is very helpful to have our excellent XBRL team in the building, and we, we utilize them quite a bit. 
Um, I would uh, like to emphasize, uh, like, like Christine did, that comparability and tagging is very important. Like investors and academics, we often seek to compare across companies as well. And differences in tagging that reflect real economic differences are uh, helpful, but differences in tagging that do not can be quite problematic. Finally, I'd like to emphasize that data quality is key. Um, we rely on this data in our decision making, as we were just discussing in the earlier question, and certainly we conduct our own data quality assessments. But to make use of the data feasible, we do have to rely on preparers to, you know, begin the process by producing a high quality data set that we can that we can utilize. So, so both of you have already touched on this in your last response, but many of our audience members today are preparers. They're really on the front lines of XBRL data tagging. If there were one or two things you'd like to tell them directly, uh, what would they be? Dr. Bodison, let me go back to you. Well, I guess I would just want to emphasize the importance of what I said a moment ago um, and to communicate that XPRL data is being used and it's being used directly in our decision-making processes. Um, it's also being used in the academic research that we will rely upon to help inform our decisions in post-implementation review and uh, as we make decisions about adding projects to our agenda and trying to solve problems. Um, because the data impacts real-world decisions, Accuracy in XPRL tagging is just so critically important. And uh, I would just like to echo Christine's thanks. Um, I also would like to thank preparers for investing in the creation of a high quality, reliable XPRL data set because it really does matter. So thank you very much. Dr. Chang, anything else that you would like to tell preparers? Yeah, I'm gonna build off of Christine's comments. Um, and just kind of say, I hope that the individuals participating today are truly aware of how their work has immense potential to affect decisions. From improving the speed and access to relevant information to improving a researcher's ability to examine the information in a way that helps our understanding of existing and proposed regulation effects on the market, their work truly is the cornerstone in ensuring that a better data-enabled decision could be made. So I'd like to just finish um, by Again, reiterating exactly what Christine said, we really appreciate the work that the preparers on the call do and the care that you guys give to ensuring that accurate tagging. Our work as researchers and teachers is highly dependent on the quality of the work that you guys do every single day. All right, shifting gears a little bit, but artificial intelligence is certainly top of mind in any discussion these days, particularly those involving data. Uh, Dr. Chang, how might AI tools be used to facilitate the use of XBRL data tagging and any concerns with improper usage? That's an excellent question, um, Brian. I do think everybody is worried about, you know, how is AI about to change the landscape? And I think it's definitely a very powerful tool. It promises to improve the speed with which we can process routine information. So kind of coming back to Christine's earlier comments with respect to the comparability across firms and time, um, AI just has the power to ramp up our ability to ferret out those comparability issues that we're taking a look at. However, um, I do have concerns, right? Um, like most tools, the insights that we gain from AI depend heavily on responsible use. Um, I fear that there could be a temptation to increase the processing speed and that that could come at the cost of learning important insights that's gained from the broader use of information, like the meaningful variation that we have in tagging. And Dr. Bodison, in the past, you've been proactive in helping facilitate training sessions for XBRL data uh, usage for academics in particular. Um, what sort of challenges have you seen newer users face when starting to work with XBRL data? So I, I think that the challenges that I've seen are um, those that uh, Christine mentioned um, right at the beginning of our conversation. And that is the learning curve and um, the barriers to entry. But um, I, I think that the work that Christine and, and other academics have been doing to try to, to ease the um, introduction to using uh, XBRL data in research and um, 
lower those barriers to entry have been very effective. Um, you know, when we started this effort, um, uh, I, along with um, my colleagues in, on the XBRL team, um, to really encourage more use by academics of XBRL data, um, there was really just a small handful of XBRL enthusiasts, I would say, um, that were really committed to the use of XBRL data. And most other academics were still relying on data aggregators to do the work for them, like CompuStat um, is one example. But, um, but I think that with the lowering of the barriers to entry and greater recognition on the richness of the data set, such a great word that Christine used, the richness of the data set that's available to academics, um, that that has really spurred greater interest and all of the different things that we've been trying to do to spread the word um, just hit sort of at the right moment to, um, to really, I think, support and encourage the increased use of XREL data among academics. And so now when um, I speak at an event or when uh, the XBRL team comes to an academic event, what I've noticed is that um, the audience is not just the enthusiasts anymore. It's a diverse group, a broad-based group of academics from just, you know, young PhD students all the way through to senior faculty members. And it's really moved from being a niche tool to becoming much more mainstream. So I think it's probably dangerous as, as it can be to make predictions, but I really do believe that in the next several years, use of XBRL data in academic research is gonna become very common. It's gonna become sort of the standard. That would be my expectation. Okay, great. Um, and then kind of continuing with that theme. So I'm curious just broadly how each of you sees XBRL data usage, even uh, whether with academics or beyond evolving over the next few years. Um, Dr. Chang, just for, first from more of an academic perspective, where do you see things moving in the shorter term? Yeah, I'm going to echo exactly what Christine just said um, in that when you go to conferences now, everybody um, is bringing to bear all of their institutional knowledge in a diverse set of interests. So as I was mentioning earlier, I get to work with a great group of academics and for lack of a better term, we all just kind of like to geek out on different areas. So I'm a tax geek and then we have other geeks um, in the room. And it's, it's super neat to see all of the different lenses through which the academics are approaching the XBRL data, both in terms of not just figuring out how to use it, but how to answer really incredibly important questions that you cannot answer using standardized data or data that has gone through somebody else's decision-making process. And so I honestly just see an explosion of research topics, questions, and very important insights that we're about to gain from XBRL data use. And then, Dr. Bosson, you touched on this in your last response, but from your perspective, uh, maybe from a standard setter uh, perspective, how do you see XBRL data usage evolving? I think as the cost of manipulating and analyzing big data sets continues to decline um, and tools that make it easier to do so become more ava available, my hope would be that um, we, uh, you know, a small organization like the FASB could increasingly utilize the data to make more data-driven decision-making. The more that we can base our decisions on data, I always feel the better the decisions uh, we make. I also think that the volume of the data and the speed with which it becomes available um, and the, the, the fact that it reflects the actual financial information that entities are um, putting out into the world um, is going to help support the production of standard setting relevant research that will be timelier, more on point, more useful to us as standard setters, and more broad based in terms of the companies that are included in the analysis. So um, I think that it's going to result in an improvement in academic research that's going to help me as a standard setter. All right. With that, I want to thank both of our keynote speakers today for sharing their excellent insights, Dr. Bodison and Dr. Chang. Uh, and I'll now turn it back over to Vicki. 
Thank you, Brian. And now I'd like to introduce Julie Morlow and Audrey Wang from the SEC Office of Structured Disclosure. Um, they will be discussing the 2024 SEC update on taxonomies and data quality. I believe, Julie, that you're going to be up first, so I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Vicki, and we're very happy to be here. Thank you for including us. Uh, let's go to the next slide. We'll start with our disclaimer. Today's presentation is provided in our official capacity as the Commission's Assistant Director of the Office of Disclosure and the Commission's Staff Accountant of the Office of Disclosure, but it does not reflect the views of the Commission, Commissioners, or other members of the staff. Next slide. Here are the topics we'd like to discuss with you today. Updates on SEC taxonomies, data quality guidance and trends we've issued in the past year, Overview of Financial Data Transparency Act and how it relates to the commission and a list of resources for more information. Next slide. And now I'm gonna hand it over to Audrey. Thank you, Julie. As of Edgar 24.1 update in March, Edgar accepts 17 taxonomies in addition to US GAAP and SEC reporting taxonomy, which are updated by FASB and the IFRS taxonomy, which is updated by the International Accounting Standard Board. Of the 17 taxonomies updated by SEC staff, three were newly added in the past couple Edgar releases. Last December, we introduced the fund taxonomy that includes tax for fund name disclosure required by the commission rule on investment company names adopted last year. In January 2024, we introduced the filing fee disclosure taxonomy, which is used to tag filing fee information for various Securities Act, Exchange Act, and investment company form the schedules that require filing fee exhibit, showing the information to come up with the filing fee amount. In the March Edgar update, we introduced the self-regulatory organization taxonomy for clearing agencies that provide a central matching service to tag the information in the newly required annual reports regarding street through processing. The ones not highlighted in the slide are not new taxonomies, but we also made updates to their respective 2024 versions, some of them with more substantive changes than others. Next slide. The major update to the ECD taxonomy is that we added members for the adjustment in the pay versus performance disclosures to get from the compensation amount in the summary compensation table to the amount of compensation actually paid, the reconciliation between the two columns in each of the green boxes. Filers were previously expected to create customer members under the adjustment to compensation access for tagging this adjustment, but we have noticed Custom members created by filers largely land up with the specified adjustments in the rule, so they are now members for each of those specified adjustments. Next slide. We updated the open-end fund taxonomy to use the legal entity access for disclosures related to only a particular series within a form in CSR, because there could be multiple series within one filing. We also updated some of the form instruction references, driving some of the open-end fund concepts. Finally, for the taxonomies that are based on ISO standards, we made substantive changes to the currency, exchanges, and subnational jurisdiction taxonomies to align them with the latest version of their respective ISO standards. There are also other smaller changes that I won't cover, but I would encourage everyone to take a look at the latest release notes at the URL provided here at the bottom of the slide to see all the changes made for the 2024 taxonomies. Next slide. Switching gears to data quality, staff in the Division of Genomic and Risk Analysis periodically perform assessments over the SBL data submitted in Edgar. If we notice any trends or issues that are systematic, we would post those observations or quality reminders on our webpage shown here. Over the past year, we have posted four data quality reminders. The most recent one relates to the presentation structure on the cash flow statements. We found 
certain elements that should have been child elements of one of the three abstracts, operating, investing, or financing activities were presented as child elements of another one. For example, payments to acquire software being presented as a child element of financing activity abstract, which is incorrect. Filers should go back to the U.S. GAAP taxonomy to make sure their parent-descendant relationships on the statement of cash flows are set up properly. The second data quality reminder here relates to label changes. We found some filers using different labels for the same reported item, same element, switch labels back and forth between when they file a Form 10-Q and 10-K. Filers should ensure that their labels assuming there are no changes to the reported item, are consistent regardless of the form or period in which they are reporting that item. The third data quality reminder relates to tagging allowance for credit losses. We issued a similar data quality reminder a couple of years back, but we are still seeing some filers create custom tags for disclosure required by ASC Topic 326 when those elements have been added to the U.S. GAAP taxonomy several years ago. In some cases, we are still seeing filers use tags that have codification references already superseded by topic 326. Filers who have disclosures related to topic 326 should double check that they are using the appropriate tags from the U.S. GAAP taxonomy. The last data quality reminder we issued in June last year is also related to statement of cash flow. We observed elements and the operating activities were incorrectly presented as child elements of investing or financing activities. Next slide. In addition to data quality reminder on our webpage, as part of the March release every year, Edgar incorporates the latest version of the Data Quality Committee Rules Taxonomy, DQCRT. This rule set is first posted by the FASB every December and is a subset of all the validation rules that SBRUS publishes. For 2024, the FASB added 24 of those rules to the existing set from 2023 for a total of 46 validation rules spanning across a wide range of topics. When a filer makes submission in Edgar using the US GAAP taxonomy, the submission is automatically screened for these validation rules in the DQCRT. If the submission fails any rule, Edgar will return a warning. Filers can still make the submission if they get a warning. The staff would encourage all filers to go through all the warnings to make sure there isn't any correction needed in the SBL tagging. The technical guide and other information on the DQCRT are available on FastSpeed website for SBL taxonomies. With that, I will hand over to Julie to talk about Financial Data Transparency Act. Thank you. Thanks, Audrey. In December 2022, the Financial Data Transparency Act, FDTA, was signed into law of uh, other requirements. One of the requirements for the commission is to issue a semi-annual report to Congress every 180 days on the commission staff's use of data and also the public's uh, use of machine readable data for corporate disclosures. The last report was uh, issued in December of 2023, which is publicly available. The first report was June 2023, which is also available, and it discusses the uh, points that are made here in the slide. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out is that, you know, we often get questions about how the commission staff use the data. So I strongly encourage you to take a look. It discusses how different groups within the commission, for example, Office of the Chief Accountant, Enforcement, our group, you know, Corfin and Investment Management staff use the data. We also included an appendix of all the forms uh, that are required to have structured data uh, in machine readable format at the end of the reporting appendix. Uh, so please take a look. And we've also heard from other uh, audience members how useful that information is. Okay, next slide. 
In addition to the uh, requirement to submit a congressional report, the commission is required to adopt data standards for reports filed under various provisions of the, we have to go back one slide. Under various provisions of the 1933 Act, 1934 Act and 1940 Act, the commission staff also has to identify a legal entity identifier that enables openness and machine readability of public data. We also have to establish a data quality improvement program. So as you heard from Audrey, you're aware of all the efforts that our staff uh, do on the data quality. There are other folks within the building who work on data quality. So for example, the Division of Corporate and Finance staff issued a sample comment letter they may issue to their filers, operating companies, on certain XBL issues. Some of the issues that's discussed in that letter are if the filer did not give us inline XBL data at all, if the filer did not tag data points required under the pay versus performance rule, if a filer has a custom tag rather than a, a standard tag from GAP taxonomy, or a standard disclosure, for example, income statement line item. And the letter does make clear that these are just examples of common letters, letters, comments that they may get. So it's not an exhaustive list. Next slide, please. Here are the list of resources you may find useful. The first bullet is to our homepage. Easy way to remember is xbrl.scc.gov. Second bullet shows all the staff observation and guidance that we've worked on on data quality. If you have technical questions on structured data, please contact us at um, structureddata.scc.gov. If you have tagging questions, including the compliance questions, for example, what needs to be tagged, what doesn't need to be tagged, please contact the policy division, such as corporation finance or investment management. And please uh, feel free to sign up to receive emails from us, um, structured data news. This concludes our uh, presentation and we greatly appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, Vicky. Thank you, Julie. And now I'd like to read a disclaimer. Mm -hmm. Um, for all of the FASB presenters, the views expressed in this presentation are those of the presenters. Official positions of the FASB are reached only after extensive due process and deliberation. And now I'd like to turn over the presentation to Donna Johanneman, Senior Project Manager of the Taxonomy Team. She will cover, or at least begin, the 2020 GAP Taxonomy Improvements Overview. Donna, welcome. Donna, you're on mute. Thank you, Vicki. Sorry about that, everybody. Let me start over. Um, the 2024 GAP taxonomy saw an increase in new elements, mainly from accounting standard updates for segments, crypto assets, and income taxes, along with SEC requirements for employee benefit plans, filing Form 11K to start tagging an XVRL. Detailed information about the improvements can be found on the taxonomy page of our website. And we're gonna talk about segments, income taxes, and the employee benefit plans in more detail later in the webcast. In this section, we're gonna to touch upon a couple improvements, crypto assets and government assistance. We'll also discuss updates to some of our implementation resources, including taxonomy implementation guides and frequently asked questions. 
On this slide is a list of the amendments to the accounting standards and SEC rules that have taxonomy improvements for the 2024 version. For those listed in bold, as I mentioned previously, we'll talk about a bit more later. For the other updates listed, we're not going to go into detail, but you can locate improvements for the taxonomy for them in the accounting standards codification by topic or by using the search functions in the taxonomy online review and comment system or our release notes that are available on our website with that link as provided on the previous slide. Finding the elements through the codification is illustrated on this slide using crypto assets as an example. For 350-60-50-1, there are subparagraphs A through D for the name of the crypto asset, the cost, fair value, and the number of units held. If you click on the ellipsis by the top arrow, you will see a dropdown with the second selection being C, XBRL, elements. If you click that, you will get a pop-up that shows for each subparagraph the elements referenced there to meet the reporting requirements. So for example, subparagraph B for the cost basis includes for the disclosure reference a dimensional structure for tagging each significant crypto asset. This structure includes the elements with suffixes of axis, domain, line item, and the table for the structure. The element for the value of the cost is the third element in the list under disclosure reference for subparagraph B. In addition, there's an extensible enumeration element, the last one in the list under B disclosure reference, for the situation in which there may be only one crypto asset and there's no need for the dimensional structure to disaggregate among more than one value. You'll also note there's under B common practice reference elements for the cost basis split between restricted and unrestricted if that information is chosen to be reported. The elements for the crypto asset requirements, which we just saw a snippet of, are under relationship group 370000 in the taxonomy. And you can also find them by using the search function in our taxonomy online review and comment system using either the ASU number or short name, which is provided in our release notes. And you can see them in the box on the right on the slide. I use the number as illustrated, and by clicking highlight, the elements with changes based on the update will be highlighted in yellow and listed below as shown in the right screenshot on the slide. Now, not all are listed here due to space constraints. So there are multiple ways of finding the elements needed for the reporting of crypto assets and other topics. We also want to touch upon improvements we made to Topic 832 Government Assistance in the 2024 taxonomy because we added 75 new elements based on a review of how filers were reporting. The requirement in 832.10.50-3 for the line items in the balance sheet and income statement that are affected by the government assistance it's somewhat broad for structuring in the taxonomy. And based on our review of filings, there were various ways filers were reporting. And so we added more elements to this topic to assist with tagging that information. This should help reduce extensions and increase consistency and comparability. So if you're reporting this information, take a look at the elements added as it might help you reduce extensions that you may have needed previously. So Don, if I might interject here, sure. you mentioned a couple of ways of finding the elements for tagging. Do you see one is better than the other? Well, in my opinion, while well, you can find them in different ways, going from the codification is going to be the most direct for the reporting requirement you're trying to tag. If I need to tag the cost of my crypto asset to meet a requirement, if I look at the elements for that paragraph in the codification, as we just saw, it is all right there. So that would be my first choice to at least start. So we're now going to talk about some updates to our resources, including taxonomy implementation guides and frequently asked questions or FAQs from improvements we made in the 2024 taxonomy. 
We have a few guides that are being updated to align with the improvements, with the ones in bold being new for this year. Some of these updates are a result of amendments to the accounting standards or SEC rules, counting changes, play benefit plans, segment reporting and income taxes are being updated or added new because of the amendments to the standards and SEC rules. For business development companies, examples were added to illustrate some modeling and common reporting practices that were observed in the filings. The update to leases is to include an example for leases not yet commenced obligations. The other guides are updated for label changes, deprecations, and related party remodeling. The location dimensions guide is to assist in the appropriate use of these dimensions, and David will talk more about that later. So keep an eye out for the publication of these on our website. Some are published currently, while others are still in process. Similar to our taxonomy implementation guides, we may have to update FAQs for changes to the taxonomy. Again, label changes, deprecations, and modeling changes. We generally add FAQs for more narrow examples that may not warrant an entire guide, but may need more explanation than we can put in a taxonomy implementation note. You can tell by the year and month next to the FAQ when it was added or revised. We added FAQ 2.19 around related parties in April and revised it in June to reflect additional changes. FAQ 2.21 was added in November to clarify the intended tagging for leases not yet commenced obligations. We added FAQ 2.22 in February of 2024 to clarify some taxonomy implementation notes that were in the 2024 that may be confusing. As part of our remodeling of related party tagging, we updated the FAQ because we deprecated an access and domain and moved members under another existing dimension. We modified labels to include the members moved. The related party type axis was broadened to include the non-related party member and to nest the members for the various types of related parties under the related party member on that same axis. If you have related party values presented, I encourage you to take a look at that updated FAQ. There was some confusion about how leases not yet commenced information should be tagged for the aggregate amount and each of the succeeding five years. So two new member elements for operating and financing leases not yet commenced were added for use with the unrecorded obligations axis and existing line item elements to tag the leases not yet commenced obligation. Also in the relationship group 842000 in the taxonomy for leases, the labels on the unrecorded obligation elements are presented to identify that they also include leases not yet commenced to assist with locating them as, you know, these sometimes are presented together with other lease disclosures. And as I mentioned, we add an example for this in the leases guide too. Generally, transition taxonomy implementation notes, or TINs, are used to identify elements intended to be used before and after adoption of an amendment to the accounting standards. There is an FAQ 2.22 to clarify that the TINs that are on certain elements for earnings per share and income from continuing operations per share are not meant to preclude use after adoption of accounting standard update 2023-06, and the TINs on these elements will be removed in the 2025 taxonomy. So Donna, I have another question for you here. Sure. So, so there's some FAQs related to income taxes, and you mentioned that an income tax guide is going to be published as well. So will someone you know, looking for impl implementation information have to look in both places? We are gonna incorporate the FAQ information into the income taxes guide and we'll remove it from the FAQs so that the information will all be in one place and you'll not have to go to both. 
So with that, that's uh, my section completed and I'm gonna turn it over to Melissa to talk about segments. Thank you, Donna. So for final ASU 2023-07 on segment reporting, overall, there were about 20 new elements added to the GAP taxonomy and about 10 label modifications, some of which I will overview, starting with the taxonomy improvements for the new disclosure requirements, then the improvements for the clarifications to the existing requirements in topic 280, followed by other improvements for the existing segment and interest models that are in the taxonomy. So first, for the new disclosure requirements, the existing segment model, that is the segment's axis and the respective entity-specific segment members are intended to be used with existing line item elements in the taxonomy for tagging the significant segment expenses that are regularly provided to the CODM and included within each measure of segment profit or loss. And the segments axis and the respective members are also intended to be used with the new line items for tagging the new requirement to disclose other segment items by reportable segment and the description of its composition. For tagging the new requirement to disclose the title and position of the CODM, a new extensible enumeration element has been added to the taxonomy. And what's a bit unique here is that space separated values would communicate multiple parties are identified as the CODM, regardless of how many titles each party may hold. So when one value is entered, that communicates the title and position of a single party. So if the CODM is identified as the, if the CEO is identified as a, C, as a CODM and he happens to have the title of um, executive vice president, then one value is intended to be entered with both titles. And you can take a look at the implementation notes that have been provided for this element to uh, understand how the values are to be entered. So in terms of the improvements for the clarifications that are made to topic 280, um, for tagging the recasting of previously reported information, the intent is to use the new true-false line item to indicate to users of the data that segment information has been recast. And one point about this true-false element it's, it's a mechanism that's used in the taxonomy and in other XBRL projects and other taxonomies around the globe to indicate to a user whether a certain condition exists in the data, regardless of how that information is stated in the text. So here, it's intended to communicate to users whether previously reported segment information has been recast. So if segment information is not recast in the, in the current period and the segment amounts are provided in the current period under the old basis of segmentation, then this new axis, segment reporting as if old segmentation basis axis is intended to be used. And if amount and for the amounts that are reported under the old basis, well, then the old basis member would be applied. And if there's a difference provided between the old basis and the new basis, then the difference member would be applied. And the amounts that are reported under the current basis, well, those would be tagged in the default. For now, in light of this ASU, we did revisit the existing segment model in discussions throughout last year with our taxonomy advisory group, and we determined that a change to how segment information is tagged is not needed, but rather more education and more data quality committee validation rules could assist with ensuring the consistency in how segment information is tagged. And so the segment model in XBRL is to use the segment's axis and depending on the reconciliation provided for the reportable segment amounts to the consolidated amounts, then both the segment's axis and the consolidation item's axis are intended to be used. And so to the segment's axis, we've added a new member, which is shown here in red. And that's the reportable segment aggregation before other operating segment member, where the existing corporate segment member is now nested as a child. And for the remaining members on this axis, we've modified the labels. And that's shown here in green. 
And so what was previously the other segments member is now the other operating segment member. And what was previously the corporate and other member is now the corporate segment and other operating segment member. Now for the consolidation items axis, we've also modified the existing members on this axis. And you can see those highlighted here in orange. So what was previously the segment reconciling items member is now the segment reporting reconciling items excluding corporate non-segment member. And we've also clarified the corporate non-segment member to just uh, to indicate that it is reconciling item for corporate non-segment members. Now, whether additional reconciling items are needed is a consideration we're looking into for the 2025 taxonomy. Now, the last set of improvements, interestingly enough, arose for the interest elements because of the updated illustrative examples that were provided in this ASU. And that is the addition of the interest elements that you see here in red and the modifications to the existing interest elements that you see here in green. So the interest model in the taxonomy now consists of nine line items for interest revenue, interest expense, interest revenue net of interest expense separately for operating, non-operating, and total operating and non-operating amounts. And last, we do plan to issue an updated taxonomy implementation guide for segment reporting, and that would be updated to include the illustrative examples to um, that were provided in this ASU, as well as incorporating some of the new elements I just covered, and that is pending the reconciling items issue. So be on the lookout for that in the next coming months. And with that, I will now turn it over to Kathy to cover income taxes. Thank you, Marisa. So for the final ASU 2023-09 on income taxes disclosures, modeling for income taxes got improved to accommodate updated requirements. First of all, we would use existing line item elements to tag income or loss from continuing operations before income tax expense or benefit, as required by the ASU to be disaggregated between domestic and foreign. So we would have three individual line item elements serving for different purpose. We also would use existing line item elements to tag income tax expense or benefit from continuing operations required to be disaggregated by federal, which is national, state, and foreign. Detailed line item elements are shown here in the screenshot on the slide. For tagging effective tax rate reconciliation items as required by the ASU, a dimensional structure will only be used on reconciling items where it was structurally needed. An extensible enumeration element would be used to communicate the country of domicile, which is federal or national jurisdiction, for the reconciling items that were not further disaggregated and represent report what value. I know it sounds a little bit complex, so here we have an example showing how the improved modeling will work. Uh, I'm not going to talk through the example in detail here, but basically for reconciling items that got disaggregated between federal and foreign, a dimension would be used to convey information about jurisdiction. And for reconciling items are all from one jurisdiction, which means there is no further disaggregation then an extensible enumeration element conveying the information of jurisdiction would be used with general items for tagging. If you are interested, you could refer to this example for more details. And also, this example will be included in a proposed implementation guide on income taxes, as Donna just mentioned, to be issued during this year. Lastly, for tagging income taxes, paid that are required to be disaggregated by federal, state, and foreign jurisdictions. Additional item elements are created for federal, state, and foreign taxes paid, as we could hear from the slide. And to tag taxes paid to specific jurisdictions where a 5% threshold is met, as required by the ASU, a dimensional structure would then be applied for further disaggregation of jurisdictions.
So Kathy, I'd like to pose a question here to Professor Chang. Given her high level of interest in taxes, um, we were wondering if you use, uh, you know, how academics would use this information and how you would think about this from an investor perspective. And, and when is this information most relevant, do you think? Christine? Lewis, I think those are excellent questions. Um, and I think, honestly, we just went through a period where particularly the slide that's up now talking about the disaggregation of income taxes paid by jurisdiction is very relevant. So we went through the global pandemic. Congress passed several relief measures, um, one of which would provide cash to companies based on former income taxes paid to the federal government. And if we had access to this information, whether it was academics or investors, we could really start to answer some questions regarding how much of a benefit companies would get from that cash infusion during a time of economic crisis. And if we were looking more towards the standard setters, then congressional leaders who passed that relief measure might have a good indication about which firms stand to benefit, how much benefit could be provided through this measure. And coming back to Christine's points um, in the fireside chat, making better data enabled decisions. Christine, thank you for adding to that. So I think we're shuffling over to David now. And David, you may yes. be muted. No, I'm I'm here. Uh, next slide, please. I, I will be covering the um, financial statement location dimensions uh, preparers guide, uh, which was published to help explain use of the financial statement location dimensions. And those are listed on the next slide, along with two newly added dimensions for the 2024 taxonomy. As you can see from the image, the comment period is closed. And at this point, we are evaluating whether to complete the guide as is or to provide additional information and re-expose. Today, we will be covering two examples from the guide at a high level. On this slide are the two financial statement location dimensions that are explained in the guide. They are the statement of financial position location balance axis which is commonly known as the balance sheet location axis, and the statement of income location balance axis, which has been known as the income statement location axis. As you can see, the labels have been improved for 2024. And um, in order to um, clarify intended usage of the dimensions. Now, the reason we created this guide was to help address usage of the two axes as we frequently see their use in ways in which they were not intended when they were created. And next we'll be covering an example from the guide. So here is the example using the statement of financial position location balance axis. The disclosure shows where the lease balances were disclosed in the statement of financial position in the middle column of the disclosure, which is on the left side of the screen. As you can see um, in the tagging image on the right, the axis is used for both the operating and financing leases as the balances are split between different captions in the balance sheet. The extensible enumerations are used to provide the exact location um, of the element where the balance is disclosed. Because the balances for operating leases current and non-current are not being disaggregated into different captions, the access is not needed, only the extensible enumerations. On this slide are the two new axes that have been added for the 2024 taxonomy. An analysis of the data showed that filers were using the old balance sheet location axis um, to convey where activity or duration balance, balances were being recorded or reported. So it can be thought of as a journal entry and is illustrated that way in the guide to help explain use. They are intended to only be used with monetary duration elements and draft DQC rules are currently out for exposure to try and limit usage of these axes. And here is an example from the guide illustrating how to use one of the new axes, the statement of financial position, location, activity, accrual axis. 
So like I said, this access is for duration items disclosed in the statement of income that are accrued in the statement of financial position. The disclosure is detailing where license revenue was recorded, which is, which is in accounts receivable and other current assets. The journal entry detailing the included balances from the disclosure is in the middle image on the right. And at the bottom is the, um, the image for the tagging. So David, um, the financial location dimensions, the financial statement locations dimensions, those aren't new axes. So why are we creating this guide? Well, Lewis, in our own data analysis, we frequently see the axes used and not necessarily in ways in which it is expected or intended. We wanted to get guidance out to help explain their intended usage and to try and address any missing elements in the taxonomy such as the two new axes, and also provide guidance on using those two axes. And I'll turn it over to Melissa for employee benefit plans. Thank you, David. So the SEC released final rules that were effective July 2022, which mandated the use of inline XBRL for the financial information required to be filed on a Form 11K. Now the Form 11K, that's an SEC filing for the annual reports, which include the financial statements, the notes and certain schedules of employee stock purchase savings and similar plans, which we've abbreviated to employee benefit plans in the taxonomy. So the Form 11K filings will mirror the inline requirements that are currently uh, you provide for your Form 10K or 20F or 40F filings, which means that in addition to tagging every number in the financial statements, there will also be level one block tagging for each financial statement note, level two accounting policies tagging for each accounting policy in any note to the financial statements, or level three tables tagging for each table in any note to the in the statement and level four detail tagging for every numeric value in any note to the financial statement. Now, a three year transition period from that effective date of July 2022 was uh, provided and that will be here before we know it. And so to that end, about 370 new employee benefit plan elements were added to the 2024 GAAP taxonomy. And I will provide an overview of what you need to know about these elements. First, where can you find these elements? What elements are available for tagging? Why were specific elements created? When do you use a legal entity access? Who publishes the guidance for the references that you're going to see on these elements? And how to use the employee benefit plan elements for tagging? So first, where can you find the employee benefit plan elements? If you go to FASB.org and navigate to FASB taxonomies and click on 2024 GAAP financial reporting taxonomy, you will see the first link that's highlighted in the red box for the 2024 GAAP employee benefit plan after signing, after completing a disclaimer, it will take you to the taxonomy online review and comment system or TORC system. And um, if you don't have access to that, you all you would need to do is supply an email address. But if you do have access to it, uh, once you log in, you will see for the US GAAP 2024 taxonomy, there's a separate entry point, which is highlighted here on the right in the red box for employee benefit plan. There's also the an Excel file that has been provided and the link is shown here at the bottom of the screen for the employee benefit plans. Now, actually, before I move on, I think it might be helpful here to ask David if you can briefly describe how the employee benefit plan elements were structured in the 2024 GAAP taxonomy. Uh, sure, Melissa. Uh, I'm going to get technical here for any developers that are on the call. Uh, the EBP modeling and elements are in a separate directory uh, uh, within the U.S. GAAP taxonomy. It's very similar to what we do with the DQCRT and now the meta model, which I'll talk about later. Uh, it is still a part of the US GAAP taxonomy, but the elements are contained in a separate schema file. And this was done intentionally uh, so that the elements would just be available for 11K filings. It still imports the US GAAP and SRT, um, but it, 
it works the other way to where uh, the EBP elements would not be uh, needed and available for other filings such as 10Ks or Qs. This is a quite technical area, so if anyone has any additional questions, feel free to contact me, and my contact information is on the FASB site. Melissa? Well, thank you for that, David. And so because that structure exists, when you're in Torx, you will see the presentation groups and the calculation groups, relationships and the elements, labels, and references specifically structured for tagging your Form 11K information. So notice whether it's the calculation groups on the left or the presentation groups on the right, the elements are contained in groups starting with this 9611 series. And so for first, you will see in the presentation groups, the statements. Then you will see a comprehensive text block group for the level one, two, and three block tagging elements, followed by the elements for the disclosure groups. And so if you downloaded the Excel file, you can see the same information, except they're going to be in the different tabs. So if you notice on the bottom, there's a separate tab for presentation um, and then calculation relationships and for references. Now, one point about using this Excel file, in order to locate the elements that are specific to employee benefit plans, you could filter uh, using the prefix column by US GAAP EBP. Now, what elements are available for tagging the employee benefit plan information? So except for certain dimensions, and those are the access and member elements, only specific employee benefit plan elements are intended to be used for tagging. And when we say specific, you will find those elements but with um, you know, having the employee benefit plan terminology in the standard label. They have the US GAAP EVP prefix or namespace in the taxonomy. That will mean they, there are specific line items, text blocks, policy text blocks, table text blocks available for tagging. There are also specific access elements, four of which are included here on the slide. And there are also specific member elements that have been included on the investment type axis. Now these member elements are specific to employee benefit plans because these characteristics have been modeled elsewhere in the taxonomy as line items. And so as not to inadvertently create two ways of tagging the information. In terms of the non-specific employee benefit plan elements, well, those could be identified with, you know, namespaces or prefixes that start with US GAAP or SRT or DEI. And those access elements consist of, you know, the legal entity axis, the investment type axis, the investment identifier axis, or the fair value hierarchy axis, or the statistical measurement axis. And these axis elements have been included in the uh, examples that were uh, developing currently for the uh, taxonomy implementation guide on uh, for the 11K filings. In terms of the elements that are available for tagging the statements, now um, here on the left, you'll see the elements available for the statement of net assets available for benefits. And on the right, the statement of changes uh, in net assets available for benefits. And what I first want to just draw your attention to are the elements available um, for the employee benefit plan asset elements, which are shown here on the left. And those elements are debit elements, followed by the employee benefit plan liability elements, which are credit elements, and then the net asset available for benefit element, which is also which is modeled as a debit. Now, when you think about the statement of changes in net assets available for benefits, you'll, you know, it's essentially a roll forward of the beginning and ending balance of net assets available for benefits. And so the increases or the elements for tagging the additions to net assets available for benefits, well, those are included here as debit elements followed by the elements for the decrease to net assets, which are credit elements. And so the net increase decrease element is a debit element. Now, the reason to point this out is that it will affect what you input as an XPRL value when you're building out your calculation relationships. Or in the event that there is, you know, you need to extend an element for your primary statement that's not included here in the gap taxonomy, um, then you would need to follow this modeling in order to uh, create your calculation relationships so that they could work. 
Now, if any of these line items are disaggregated by a certain characteristic, so by investment type or participation status or allocation status, then the applicable line item elements would need to be tagged with the access elements that are provided in these groups. And one thing to note about the access elements, they are primarily to be used for tagging the disaggregation of total amounts by specific characteristics, except in the case of the legal entity access, which I will talk about a little more shortly. Now, within the 9611 groups, there are disclosure groups, starting with 9611.10, that where you're going to find the elements available for tagging the notes to the financial statements. So, for example, if you were to drill into the summary of accounting policy note, which is shown here on the right, you'll see that there are specific elements that are available for tagging the level one text block information and the policy text blocks that could be uh, disclosed, which are shown here in the yellow. Next, here is another example of what elements are available for tagging the notes to the financial statements, and this time for the master trust note. And if you were to drill into that presentation group, you will see that there's a specific table element and there are there's a new uh, master trust access element that's been added with specific members for tagging the master trust information and the plan interest in master trust information. Now, in this particular presentation group, the elements that are available here uh, include the elements for level one, two, three, and four tagging in the line item section. In terms of the elements that are available for tagging the schedule information, you'll see in the 9611 uh, disclosure groups that the elements that are included here for the schedules actually say schedule in the, in the label for that presentation group. And what you'll notice if you drilled into the schedule of asset held for investment purpose, you'll see the elements for um, the level three and level four tagging, as well as the access elements that are intended to be applied. And in this particular case, the investment identifier axis and the investment type axis are intended to be used. Now, the investment identifier axis, that's highlighted here in yellow, that's intended to be used for tagging the specific information about each issue of an investment. Whereas the investment type axis is intended to be used for tagging the amounts disaggregated by type of investment. And in terms of, and there are examples that are included in this slide about distinguishing when these two axes would be used and they are not intended to be applied on the same fact. Next, you may be wondering, well, why were specific employee benefit plan elements created? So the 2024 GAAP taxonomy distinguishes between the elements that are available for tagging the employee benefit plan information that's included in an 11K filing from other filings. And when you think about these different filings, they are for different financial statements or from different perspectives, and they serve different purposes for their users. So the information in the 11K, that's from the perspective of the employee benefit plan. And it's useful for helping, you know, users understand the risk to the participants in the plan, especially those plans that hold employer stock, such as, you know, the 401k plan. The assets of a 401k plan, for example, that's held for the benefit of the participant. They're not owned by the plan versus the financial statement information on the form 10K or Q or 20F filings. That's from the perspective of the employer of the participants in a plan. And filings that are submitted to the SEC, they're submitted under a central index key or a CIK in the aggregate database. And the CIK is the same for an 11K filing as it is for the 10K filing, which is the employer of the participants in an employee benefit plan. So for example, Walmart Inc. And when you look at, you know, when Walmart Inc., for example, sent, you know, files their 10K and they're reporting total assets in their consolidated balance sheet, so that's that $243 billion here at the bottom for 2023. That's intended to be tagged with a U.S. GAAP 
assets element. But when Walmart 401k plan submits their statement of net assets um, available for benefits and they're reporting total assets of 36.7 billion here for 2020 2023 in their form 11k, well, that's intended to be tagged with the employee benefit plan asset element. And when you, you know, it's helpful for users of the XBRL data querying assets, for example, to get the assets of Walmart Inc. separately from the assets for Walmart 401k plan. And when these elements are tagged in this way, they will get that information uh, for the different entity to which you know, these statements apply. And um, there is a little unique situation that can arise with the 11K filings that doesn't occur with the 10K filings in that the there could be multiple 11K filings submitted for um, the, you know, the same employer in the same plan year. And so that leads us to this next question about when do you use the legal entity access to tag the employee benefit plan information? So when one employer identified by their CIK files multiple 11Ks in the same plan year, then the legal entity access is intended to be applied to every fact that's tagged in that filing. So for example, when Walmart Inc um, sorry, so when Walmart's 401k plan is filed and 11k is filed, every fact that will be tagged in XBRL for Walmart 401k plan, the legal entity access is intended to be applied with a plan specific member that identifies this plan as the Walmart 401k plan. And for every fact and every number that is going to be tagged for the Walmart Puerto Rico 401k plan, for example, the legal entity access, along with the plan specific um, member on that access to identify the Puerto Rico 401k plan for, you know, using the employer identification um, number for Walmart and a plan number for for that particular plan, well, all of that information needs to be applied for each fact tagged. Next, who publishes the requirements or the guidance for the employee benefit plan element references? Now, as you know, references are the first criteria for element selection. And this being the GAP taxonomy, and GAP is codified in the accounting sentence codification, which is published by the FASB, topic 962 specifically covers the plan accounting for defined contribution plan. And that's the main source for the requirements for the elements created for the employee benefit plans. There's also requirements coming from the SEC under regulation SX that's included in section S99 of the accounting standards codification, which is why you will see the FASB as the publisher. And here on the right, you will see the specific sections of SX are included in the subparagraph parts. And new for the 2024 taxonomy are the requirements coming from the Employee Retirement Income Security Act, which is um, uh, administered by the Department of Labor under the Employee Securities Benefits Administration, which is um, abbreviated in the taxonomy as DOLEBSA. You will see those elements included here as well. Now, in addition to the different publishers, you're going to see different reference types or reference roles uh, for these elements. And th those are shown here in the screen as uh, either a disclosure reference, a common practice reference, or an example reference. And what this indicates is that the element is based on uh, a disclosure requirement from that specific literature, or whether there is an example that's included in the literature for in which that element was used, or if there's not necessarily an explicit requirement, but an, a requirement in that the specific disclosure would, you know, it's, it's for common practice. We've seen it used in filings, or there's not a, exactly an explicit requirement for it. Now, if you are interested in looking at and understanding the different reference roles that are available, I encourage you to download the reference style guide for additional information.
Now, last, how do you use the Employee Benefit Plan elements? Uh, for tagging the information contained in your 11K. Well, a proposed taxonomy implementation guide is in the works, and there are currently seven examples that are listed here. We are planning to issue this guide in the first half of 2024. And um, there are two examples that are included in this slide, but unfortunately we don't have time to go through these examples. And the first is showing how to tag the master trust information with the investments disaggregated by investment type. And the second shows the use of the investment identifier access. And so I encourage you to check out those examples. And when the guide is published, if there are additional examples you'd like to see modeled, or if there are additional elements that you think should be added to the taxonomy, we encourage you to please provide us with those comments using our TORC system, or please feel free to reach out. And with that, I will turn it back to David. Thank you, Melissa. Um, I am going to cover the meta model, uh, I, which I did cover last year, but as it is new and was included in the 2024 taxonomy, I do want to go over it again and spend some time uh, illustrating a couple of the uh, included relationships. It's still going to be at a high level. Uh, so if you're looking for additional information, please refer to the meta model page, which is shown on the slide. You can access it by either following the path that's at the top of the image, or you can uh, copy the link uh, from the bottom of the slide once you download. Next slide, please. Next, uh, next slide, please. Yes, thank you. Oh, no, 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 One uh, back one, please. Thank you, okay. Uh, one more, uh, back one more, sorry. Uh, so last year we added, that's the right one. Uh, we added policy election relationships to the taxonomy to provide a link between policy election elements and their related monetary or numeric elements. For example, a relationship between the element for property plan equipment depreciation method and the property plan equipment elements. Similarly structured and purpose, the meta model is intended to provide relationships that can be leveraged by preparers to identify the correct element to use for tagging. Validation rules can be written using the relationships in the meta model that assist preparers by providing validation warnings if inconsistent element use is detected. Next slide, please. Okay. The meta model is intended to have a positive impact on preparers and is not expected to um, disrupt current processes as it is additional information about the elements in the taxonomy. And the goal in the future one day is that extension elements are anchored to the meta model to better convey the properties of the extensions. Next slide, please. On this slide, we have listed out all the relationships included in the meta model. The following slides have examples. Uh, we are just going to uh, highlight a couple in the remaining few minutes we have left. And then I do have a couple quick topics to touch on after that. Um, next slide, please. So uh, first two relationships to cover are the instant accrual and instant contra. I picked these examples because they show how the relationships can work together. It's not always the case, but this is a good example of where it does. Uh, as you can see from the image, the depreciation Expense is an accrual to accumulated depreciation, and accumulated depreciation is a contra uh, account to property, plant, and equipment gross. Next slide, please. So the next two relationships to cover are uh, instant inflow and instant outflow. As indicated by their names, instant inflow represents um, <clears throat> uh, duration items that flow into the balance of the instant element, an instant outflow is the opposite, duration items that flow out of the balance. As you can see from these examples, on the left, we have proceeds from sale of property, plant, and equipment. That's an inflow to cash. And on the right side is uh, payments to acquire property, plant, and equipment, which uh, is an outflow item to cash. The relationships expressed in the mod meta model can be used to write validation rules that ensure that the elements flow into or out of cash are not um, used in the statement of income. Um, and these three relationships work together to convey attributes onto elements. They are trait domain, domain member, and trait concept. Uh, next, uh, next slide. This is the class subclass relationship. It's based on inheritance models used in programming. And this is where the, the child inherits any properties assigned to the parent element. Next slide, please. This last one is for uh, 
for highlighting equivalencies in the taxonomy where we have a concept conveyed either with a single line item or a combination of a more generic line item and a definition and access to, um, to convey that same uh, concept. Uh, next slide, please. The next one as well. So I just wanna cover this really quickly. This is information I covered last year, but um, we, uh, I, I, we did um, adopt calculations 1.1 1 .1 for the 2024 taxonomies. Uh, it is an incremental improvement to the calculations that addresses two issues, duplicate facts and rounding. Uh, it should help preparers by providing you with better feedback on calculation inconsistencies than what you currently receive. It does not address other issues we have with calculations, such as roll forwards and dimensional breakdowns along axes, as it's only an incremental improvement. And next I'll be covering the DQC update. Um, okay, so uh, Audrey did uh, touch on some of this, that we did add um, 24 new rules uh, to the DQCRT, so it's now up to 44. The DQCRT helps facilitate the work of XBRL US and the SEC by leveraging the relationships included in the DQCRT for validation um, with an expectation of data quality improvements by preparers and filing agents utilizing this, the rules. And so on uh, the next three slides, we've listed out um, all the, the, new, um, the, the new rules. Um, so when you download that, you can look through that. We also have the information on the FASB uh, DQCRT page. Uh, next slide, please, as well. And I, these last two slides I want to cover very quickly. Um, they are charts that are courtesy of XBRL US that we wanted to highlight because they show the positive impact the DQC rules and the DQCRT are having on data quality. But this is really only possible because the preparers and filing agents have done such a great job of applying these rules. This chart here shows the number of filings that do or do not contain DQC errors. As you can see, the filings with no DQC errors is increasing over time, which shows that the quality of filings is increasing. Next slide, okay. And lastly, here's another chart from XBRL US, and this shows the error rates of DQC rules that have been added to the DQCRT. As you can see, uh, the error rates go down, and in some cases, it's pretty drastic. For example, for DQC Rule 15 in the fourth quarter of 2020 had an error rate of about 2,700, but for the fourth quarter of 2023, it was down to just under 600. So we do want to thank the filing agents and preparers for applying these rules. And with that, I will turn it over to Vicki to uh, close out the um, today's session. Vicki? Thank you, David. Um, I see that we've run out of time. I'd just like to thank all of our presenters today for a very informative session. I'd also like to thank you, our audience, for, for listening to us. We hope that you've enjoyed today's um, webinar. Um, the, please make sure that you complete the course evaluation. You will need to do so to get your CPE. Um, the course evaluation will be available as a link after the presentation is over. Um, we will also be sending it to you by email. If you've met all of the requirements and completed the course evaluation, uh, you should get an email with your CPE certificate within two weeks of this webinar. Thank you all and have a wonderful afternoon.